Welcome to the Veritas Podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Ben Sixsmith. Ben is a writer who has contributed to a variety of outlets, including Quillette, the American Conservative, and of course, his very own Substack, among many others. Ben, thank you so much for joining me on the Veritas Podcast. Thank you for having me, Scott. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm excited to have you on. I've, I've followed you on Twitter for a, ra- a while, read some of your stuff in, in Quillette and a couple other places. And uh, you're a very interesting guy. You, you write about a lot of interesting stuff. So I, I wanted to start us off by just asking you about yourself in case people in the audience maybe aren't as familiar, though I'm, I bet at least a few people are familiar with your work. For those that aren't, could you just kind of introduce yourself in terms of why you do what you do? You know, what got you interested in writing about politics, religion, philosophy, and the like? So when I was younger, um, I got into reading commentators. Like when I was 14, 15, 16, I started reading people like Christopher Hitchens and even older people like uh, Bernard Levin, who was an English uh, commentator and some more kind of literary people like Clive James and Martin Amos, which is actually a terribly unhealthy uh, reading habit to get because you're not you're not really reading the kind of the, the classics and the stuff right. that all of this <laughs> material is based on. You're just reading uh, people's opinions. So right. it's, not a good, it's not a good way to get started. <laughs> and then uh, I started writing my own stuff uh, on the internet and being very opinionated, which is also a terrible thing to do. So <laughs> I want this to be a cautionary tale. Uh, if you're young, you should really wait to start writing, especially in a very opinionated way because... You haven't had that time to think about uh, right. where you really stand on things. So uh, I guess my early writing was kind of a bit chameleonic, like uh, it had various political iterations as I changed my mind about everything. Um, and then I, I kind of, when I was a teenager, I dreamed about being a writer or a political writer, and then I kind of gave up on it mm. uh, and thought nothing like that was going to happen. Uh, but I stayed on Twitter. I was kind of shit posting, uh, giving my opinions on stuff. And then when these kind of alternative outlets started up, like well, at like Area, uh, I thought, why not? So I wrote a few articles for them. And then when they took off, I kind of got carried along with it. So I got some work for other places, uh, like The Spectator, like uh, Unheard, uh, and hopefully over. Those years where I stopped wanting to be a writer, I actually developed some more sensible and grounded opinions because I wasn't so focused on spewing them out. Uh, so that's that's a little bit about where I'm coming from. Yeah, I, I can relate to the developing very strong opinions and wanting to share them as a, a teenager. I, that's how I initially became uh, like a hardcore uh, democratic activist, kind of a leftist activist here in the States and kind of was rising through the ranks of the, the youth wing of the Democratic Party and then eventually had a big 180. I haven't exactly become right wing per se, but I am certainly not left wing anymore. I don't think by any uh, generally understood standard here. But um, so did you actually start writing at 14? Um, probably a little bit later. A little bit later. I maybe remember when I, was, when I was 16, 17, I was posting on like blogs. Yeah. And just writing, writing stuff for myself that I never even published. Diaries and stuff. Yeah. Um, but blogging was where I started to express my opinions publicly. Uh, yeah. Thankfully, in a very obscure way. Yeah, that definitely helps. It's, it's weird to think about how all of the things that teenagers are writing, whether they're political or not, there's this permanent record of every stupid little thought everyone has had now, uh, you know, at 14, 15. It worries me a lot when I think about the, the future generations. But I, I, I want to ask you about kind of the state of the commentariat, you know, as someone who's, whether you like it or not, kind of a party to it. Um, uh, you know, I, I want to ask you, what do you think as a writer, as a, a columnist, of the current state of the news media, of the commentary. And I know they're not technically the same thing, but journalism and commentary are, of course, deeply, deeply linked. And it's, it gets harder to differentiate between the two as time goes on. What is kind of your opinion of the, the current state of that in the Western world? I know it's going to vary from country to country because you're English living in Poland. I'm in the US. So your opinion might be a little different, but I'm just curious. What's your general view of Western journalism and commentary and I know this is kind of begging the question a little bit, but I always am tempted to say, do you think there's anything salvageable 
there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's very varying levels of the opinion commentary. You have kind of the New York Times level, where there are some interesting writers. Obviously, my opinion is biased by my politics because I'm right leaning. So I think Ross Duthat, for example, or Dathan. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. I, I read him. I don't speak to him. <laughs> but I think his work is interesting, for example. But then there's a lot of very stale, formulaic writing by these kind of legacy commentators who've just had the job for so long and they appeal to the prejudices of enough well-heeled readers that they have tenure for some reason, like David Brooks, like Thomas Friedman. And that's a kind of the very top level of the commentarium. And then there's a kind of second level where it's much more connected with social media. Uh, you have these slightly smaller outlets uh, between the different ideological camps. So on the left, you'll have places like Jacobin, you'll have uh, places like Current Affairs. Mm. And then on the right, you could have, well, right-leaning, you could have places like Quillette, uh, or further to the right, the kind of, or I don't want to say further to the right, that makes it sound like I'm saying far, but you have more conservative outlets like, I don't know, the American conservative. Uh, and that's got so many good things and so many bad things because there's so much of it. There's always interesting writing, which maybe in the past that wasn't so true. There's, there's just so much commentary that if you know where to look, you're going to find something that's stimulating and, and entertaining. But there's there's... It's so varied that it doesn't, I feel like it doesn't really achieve anything. It's just people talking to each other and creating this kind of world of discourse. And it's quite hard to turn it into anything uh, intellectually or uh, materially productive. And then you have the bottom level, which is just everybody screaming at each other on Twitter. <laughs> yes, the, 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 the bottom level, which is also quantitatively, as I understand it, the most common. Um, and that's what I was going to say is it sounds like and I would agree with you here, there's a bit of a quantity over quality problem, uh, which is is very interesting because it's sort of a, it feels like it's a, a blessing and a curse what you're describing in the situation we're in where the idea of commentary has been sort of democratized. You know, everyone has a voice via social media and it's actually even beyond the level of just posting your opinions on Twitter and Facebook, it's pretty easy to do what I'm doing right now. I have this podcast that I run out of my little home office here you know, to do, uh, I know you're an actual professional writer, but you have a sub stack. A lot of people are creating, you know, sub stacks. And these are all opportunities for people to have these independently operated, but very sort of professional, if they, you know, as professional as they want it to be setups to share their opinions and to comment on things. And they can build pretty big audiences. The biggest example, perhaps being a Joe Rogan, who, you know, he did have an established presence in the entertainment world, but he wasn't known for providing his opinions on a, a damn thing. And he just sort of had his show. And now he's one of the biggest broadcasters in the world. What do you think of this democratization thing that has happened? Do you think it does more harm than good? Because you mentioned kind of this quantity over quality problem. There's obviously the factor that these voices can sort of counter that constant stream of kind of the bad mainstream writers you were talking about, their sort of constant propaganda. I always call it the propaganda IV because it's this constant stream that people hook up to themselves. And you can kind of disrupt that a little bit with somebody like a Joe Rogan. Somebody might get curious and check out an episode of his podcast that you know, lets them on to, to new information, or they might see somebody's, uh, you know, Barry Weiss's Substack or your Substack or, or my podcast or whatever. But at the same time, I think as you sort of implied, you end up with an oversaturation issue and it just kind of becomes this, this sort of amorphous mess. Do you think that the internet and the democratization of media has been a net positive or a net negative with these considerations? I think I have a lot of positive features, but I think you have to be, if you want to, so first I think we need to be honest with ourselves about what we're looking for in terms of commentary. So sometimes we just, we're only reading for entertainment. I'll write some pieces and I'm not really trying to reach some kind of hidden truth or make some kind of deep insight. It's, I'm really just trying to be funny, which is <laughs> fine. Uh, and I hope that people enjoy it. And I enjoy reading other writers who I might not think they're very deep thinkers, but they make me laugh. I enjoy their style, the way they write, and that's, that's all cool. 
Uh, but then if you want to have a more intellectual engagement with what you're reading, you have to be a little bit more selective. And uh, especially if you want to channel that into kind of uh, real world outcomes, because there is so much stuff, you, like I say, you can just lose yourself in the discourse and you're going to wake up 10 years in the future and think, what, what was I even doing? What was I trying to achieve there? So you need to find the people you think are really creating something productive. And uh, if you have, have enough people who think like you, you need to try and channel that into institutions that are going to uh, change the world. Uh, but you have to be sensible. I guess my answer is it's a good thing if you're sensible with how you consume it and honest with yourselves about what you're trying to get out of it. Do you think that most people are sensible in this way? Like what, what is your trust level of the general public in terms of how they've been digesting the, the internet and the sort of democratized media world for the past, you know, 10, 20 years? Well, I think, to be honest, I think most people aren't especially honest with themselves about what they're looking for. I think most people do read opinion commentators for, you know, to be entertained. Yeah. And then because it sounds more noble to tell ourselves that we're doing it for some kind of grand cultural or political or intellectual reason, uh, we kid ourselves that that's not the case. So uh, we, we, we complain about kind of clickbait. We complain about tribalism. But... Most of us, including me on many occasions, we inevitably succumb to it because there's a reason things are clickbait. It's because they're kind of entertaining and they appeal to what we happen to find engaging at the time. And there's a reason that tribalism exists and it's because we have similar opinions or we have similar values and we enjoy laughing at people who don't have those opinions and who don't have those values. So... Uh, I don't think most people consume it in that targeted kind of structured way, but I don't think most people want to. Most people do just want to, you know, on one side, they want to say, ha ha, Donald Trump, what an idiot, what an oaf. And on the other side, they want to say, you know, AOC, what a vapid individual. Uh, and that's really all they're hoping to get out of. Yeah, there's I think there's a there's also a sense of like belonging. And then as you were sort of alluding to a sense of moral superiority that people seek through their their news consumption, and they will call it news, but we we know it's not where basically they it's almost like a lot of people seem to get a lot of their self esteem, their their self, the idea that they are a good person comes from sort of looking at things on Twitter, or on the news and saying, when they see something bad, they go, well, I'm not that right. So they see the the, the January 6th riot that happened here at the U.S. Capitol that I, I'm sure you're familiar with, um, they see that, or they see, let's say, the, the the sort of Black Lives Matter inspired riots in the summer of 2020. They see either one of those things, depending from their standpoint, and they say, well, I'm not that, and I'm definitely against that, and that makes me feel better as a person. But then a lot of those people, they just sort of stick their fingers in their ear, depending on which one of those events they're looking at and go, la, 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 la. <laughs> so I think there's there's one thing that I always recommend to people is, if you're going to have a media source because you want it to be something that comes from the same viewpoint as you, that's actually okay. But you should try to pick people who, when there's a moment to talk down their own side a little bit, or sort of point out when things are getting a little extreme, that they actually take the time to do that. This is something I've given Ben Shapiro credit for. You know, He has taken time to point out when Donald Trump or the, the, the far right wing of his party are going a little extreme. Um, I would give Bill Maher on the left a little bit of credit for this, pointing out when things are getting too extreme. I think a lot of people, though, they, they don't like those interruptions to the constant sense of like, ah, yes, give me what I want to hear. And they won't bother to look for people who, even if they are solidly in one column or the other, they at least will take a moment to slow it down and say, hey, actually, this is very serious and things have gotten out of hand on, you know, in our own home here on the right or left. Yeah, I, I, just to pick up on two things you said, I do agree that people, including myself, get a kind of cheap virtue out of their own opinions. I, I don't know if you saw this, I think it was a New Yorker article about this bizarre scandal in the writing world where there was a woman who donated a kidney and then she had written a story about donating a kidney because she was a writer and she felt like she wasn't getting enough kind of esteem for donating her kidney and someone wrote a story about like an obnoxious woman who donates a kidney and they just spiraled into this bizarre 
huh. cultural and legal argument. So everybody on Twitter was kind of adopting their opinions, like who's more in the wrong? Was it the conceited woman who donated her kidney or was it the woman who wrote the story about a conceited woman who donated her kidney? And Oliver Traldi, who's an excellent writer uh, for Arc Digital and Aereo and other places, he said, well, at the end of the day, who's actually achieved anything here in this whole situation and everybody who's commenting? Who's the one person who actually accomplished something? It's, you know, the woman who saved someone's life by donating a kidney. So however conceited she was, she's the only person who's done something. And all the rest of us are just kind of enjoying making fun of people. So, but, you know, uh, not everything we do in life has to be charitable or, you know, produce any, any physical results, but we shouldn't confuse our opinions with, you know, doing good in the world. Uh, and I also agree with you that we need to look for writers who are honest about their own side and not just the other side. I think the only thing I'd say is, Sometimes criticizing your own side can itself become a kind of source of signaling. Mm. Like you're trying to say, I'm not like these oafish other people on my tribe. Uh, around the time of the Iraq war, there was a joke. It was a kind of meme. It was like, even the liberal New Republic, because New Republic were in favor of the war. And all the right wing media would be like, wow, even the liberal New Republic agrees with us. And uh, sometimes the right have that meme as well. It's, you know, the conservative case for mm. uh, gender neutral bathrooms, the yeah. conservative case for such and such. So uh, there's, we definitely should be honest with our side when there's value in doing it. But we also need to be careful that we don't do it just to kind of preen over uh, the, the crass and unsophisticated groups who might be beneath that, beneath that level. Yeah, I'm really glad, Ben, that you pointed out that phenomenon of the person just saying, well, I'm one of the good ones. I'm like, not, you know, because I, I, there are so many good examples of that. <clears throat> one of the ones that immediately comes to mind, I was trying to remember her name. I think I've got it. She's, I believe she's at the New York Times or maybe it's the Washington Post. I can't remember. Her name is Jennifer Rubin. And she yeah. was at some point supposedly a Republican. I, I haven't been in politics long enough to be familiar with that. Um, but I, she, uh, she, she has become at this point, someone whose sole output seems to be criticizing Trump, criticizing the right, which is all well and good to the extent that you want to do it. But she, for a while, sort of, sort of wore the veneer of, well, I'm a Republican criticizing the right. I'm a Republican criticizing Trump. But it got to a point where that was, there was, it was so exclusively all she was doing. It was, she was exclusively doing this one thing. Her conservative position seemed to be lost in the shuffle completely. Like there was, there was no, I looked for an indication that she was actually a conservative at one point and could not find it, um, at least not within the past like five years. And I just thought that was such a good example of a situation where I think eventually she did register as an independent and announced that maybe just a few months ago. But it was just kind of funny because that became her sole identity marker was I'm a good Republican, but it wasn't clear what she actually had in common with other Republicans. And that became a bit of a meme on the internet is she's sort of the ultimate, we have a term here, I don't know if you know it called Rhino, which is Republican in name only. And she was like the ultimate Republican in name only. It reminds me, uh, I remember a poem by a performance poet called Luke Wright. And it was all about him giving up smoking and then getting addicted to like moralizing at smokers. <laughs> so he was like, I'm running out in the streets, get screaming, hey, cancer boy, I'm better than you. That's and so then funny. the last line is, I'm giving up, giving up smoking to take up smoking again. <laughs> so yeah, I think there's, there, my point is there is a kind of convert syndrome, I think, where you do uh, kind of flip over into the other tribe, but the only actual, yeah, like you say, the only focus of your identity is I'm not there. Uh, Max Boot is another great example. Uh, if you read his book about like abandoning the right, you can tell he doesn't really have any sense of what it means to be on the right. He's just uh, floating with the, 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 the breeze of uh, whatever he takes to be uh, sophisticated and proper at the time. Yeah, it really is sort of a shame, this phenomenon where people, they sort of leave one 
you know, cult, if you will, like they get, they leave like a hardcore extreme version of one of the, the tribes. Um, let's say like the, I know it's kind of an outmoded term, but like the SJW tribe, if you will. And then they end up just going as far as possible to the right to where they think God, Donald Trump is a God emperor who can do no wrong. I've actually seen a lot of people take that journey. Cause I'm sort of in the the space of, you know, U.S. democratic activists who moved, in my case, more to the center, but some people moved to the right. And I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with that. But there were a lot of people who, in the process, they ended up, as you said, just sort of, they still based their identity on what they were not rather than what they actually support and believe in. And it's really a shame because the ability to leave one's tribe and to be an apostate, if you will, that is kind of a rare thing. And so the people who can do that have a lot of potential to be an important part of the sort of, you know, sense making and, and truth speaking process in the commentary world. But it's just such a shame that so many of the people in the sort of, let's say, intellectual dark web space, and of course, the intellectual dark web is kind of defunct now because of this. So many people went so far to the right that they alienated that sort of centristy coalition that they were building that was so interesting to begin with. Yeah, and I think there's a kind of, there's a, there are economic factors here. Uh, you know, when you do leave your tribe, you get embraced by this, mm -hmm. this big crowd of people who are so happy to have this new arrival. I think especially when people go from left to right, right wing people, for whatever reason, they just seem to be more thrilled when somebody adopts their worldview. So you're probably just so excited to get all of this, this new esteem that there's a temptation to say whatever your new audience wants you to say. And it becomes, yeah, your brand. Uh, and it, it, it is, you have to, and I'm not saying that I would ever be a particularly good example of this. I have no idea. But you have to try and retain your kind of independent mindedness in the face of these incentives. It, rem it reminds me of when uh, Solzhenitsyn left Russia, obviously a famous anti-communist and he went to America and I think his American hosts really expected him to be like, you know, rah, rah, America. I love it. You know, I'm going to McDonald's. I'm going to get a hamburger, Statue of Liberty. Woo. And actually he was very critical of the kind of liberal values of America, of consumerism, of secularism, whether you agree with him or not. Uh, I think what, what is admirable is that he didn't just embrace whatever uh, the apparent opposite of uh, the system that he'd left was. He still had his own particular sense of the world. Yeah, I've heard what I think you're referring to. I think I've heard it referred to as sort of audience capture, which especially when you're trying to monetize your opinions or trying to be a commentator, you'll find yourself in a position where, okay, let's say you build your identity on, I was a leftist, I am now leaving the left. The people that are naturally drawn to that story are more right wing. Maybe you're starting a Patreon for your little, you know, your newsletter, your podcast, whatever. And then eventually all of your subscribers are these sort of right wing people. And in order to give them the content that they want, you might feel the necessity to just push more of that sort of generic right wing red meat stuff, or it could happen vice versa. But you are right that it, it seems to happen more so with people moving from left to right. And I think that's because the, the reason that right-wingers are a little bit more thrilled when somebody joins their team or sort of apostatizes from the left, uh, defects from the left, is that they're the out party. It, it, certainly in the United States right now, the right is the out party, the opposition party. And it appears that at least culturally, they're going to be the out party for a very, very long time. And so when they do get a convert, I think it's it's rarer and it's, it's more exciting. Um, it reminds me of, there's a meme I saw on Twitter uh, where somebody uh so there's like a there's like a um there's like a centrist person standing on the line between the left and the right and they're saying i think both of these sides make good points and then the person on the left shoves them onto the right literally pushes them and then says why are you being such a nazi when the person is on the right side after he shoves them and i i can definitely say that i i've related to that experience because the the, the other uh saying for this that i think encapsulates it well is uh, I can't remember who said it originally, but I find it very true in the United States uh, as a sort of center centristy person. I'm much more comfortable sharing my left wing opinions with my right wing friends than my right wing opinions with my left wing friends. There is just something that is much, much easier right now. And I think it has a lot to do with who's actually in power and has the ability to sort of shame, you know, people for, for not agreeing. Um, I guess an interesting direction to take this would be to ask you this, Ben. I, I want to ask, 
sort of on this topic, how much of how much of what the the left has sort of been to, or not the left, let's say that the sort of the social justice left, the woke left, if you will, um, there isn't a particularly good term for what I'm talking about, but it's it's the close. The woke is, seems to be the generally agreed upon nomenclature. How much of the woke left's particular ferocity in instantiating their views and sort of pushing their views do you think has to do with the fact that they just have this institutional power? Like, could you see the the right in the Western world doing the same thing if they just had control of, let's say, the media, of the academic world, of the, the big tech industry? Do you think that it really has a lot more to do with who's in power rather than the fact that there's something unique to, let's say, the kind of woke left that makes them authoritarian? Well, as a first, there's a kind of chicken and egg situation here. I mean, the ferocity, it, it might preclude the power. You know, you have this, in political theory, you have this idea of vanguard that pushes the whole movement forward. If you have an exceptionally passionate, uh, engaged, motivated, active kind of base of believers, they have a much better chance than a bunch of people who are sitting around going, you know, maybe, 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 maybe the other side's got, you know, in Russia, pre-revolutionary Russia, if a bunch of people were sitting around thinking, you know, maybe the Tsar, he's got, he's got good and bad points. Uh, they were never going to beat a bunch of communists who were like, no, this guy's Absolutely evil. We need to remove the whole system. Who's with me? Uh, because this level of engagement and passion, uh, it counts for something. I think it was the political scientist Richard Hanania. His, his whole theory is that the success of kind of woke ideas is basically based on the fact that its believers care more than uh, right-wing people do about their ideas. And I, I, I don't know if that's entirely true, but there's definitely something to it. The, the more you're invested in the cause the likelier your chances of success will be. But definitely the fact that they have institutional power, able to wield uh, the power of tech, the power of uh, universities, power of media outlets. Obviously I'm using Bay in a very broad way. I don't mean uh, it's all one homogenous force, but you know what I mean? <laughs> it, it, gives, it gives them more ability to be angry. It gives them more ability to be intolerant. Because you can't really be intolerant if nobody's going to listen to you. It's like if I say, uh, shut up, and five people in the room say, no, you shut up, who's going to win? So uh, definitely the power gives them more ability. But I think that level of uh, passion and kind of unifying uh, conviction is what helped to get them there in the first place. Yeah. And I think therein lies kind of a, a big problem. It's, it's a really good point that I haven't given that much thought to that you end up in that position by having that sort of uh, that intensity of belief. And the fact that you have people who really are kind of true believers and at a certain point, they might be these sort of authoritarian lackeys and cultists. If you're coming from my perspective and I'm every, everyone listening to the show knows I'm not a fan of the, the woke left, but um, although I'm also not a fan of the far right by any stretch of the imagination, it's, um, it makes me worry about our system because it seems like we are rewarding. Uh, on one level, you could sort of play devil's advocate and say, okay, we reward in a democratic system the most passionate people who are willing to stand up for their views. And that's kind of the nice way of saying it. But on the other hand, it does seem like we reward people with authoritarian tendencies because if you threaten to, let's say, fire someone for not saying what you want them to say, which has become you know, the, the phenomenon of cancel culture, that is pretty effective. People don't want to get fired. I mean, you know, I always say this, I'm very open about it. Scott Veritas is not my real name. I do protect my own identity to a certain extent because I, I'll just say I don't know exactly how my employer would view uh, the content of this show. Uh, so you know, in any case, it kind of makes me worry about the whole liberal democratic system in the West. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Uh, a lot of the discourse or a lot of uh, decisions about how institutions are run are just based on shame, are based on uh, the fear of saying what you really think, not just for losing your job, but for, you know, looking stupid in front of your friends, mm -hmm. losing your friends, not seeming as fashionable as you think perhaps you could be. Uh, and maybe that's just inevitable. Maybe that's uh, as you say, if the right was in power, that's exactly how it would be from the other perspective. Uh, but it, it definitely helps you to get ahead. Because if you have a society where people don't feel like they can say X, Y, and Z, you don't actually have to ban X, Y, and Z. 
Yeah, I, I want to ask you if you think there's anything that can kind of be done about this problem because it it gets more and more extreme over time. Sharing any kind of even remotely, I, I, I hesitate to even say heterodox, which is kind of my general term for the 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 uh, the box of ideas that isn't acceptable to the sort of social justice orthodoxy, which gets bigger and bigger every day, because. It's, it's not even really heterodox. It's mostly mainstream opinions that were suddenly not mainstream, almost, you know, maybe five, six years ago. But in any case, I wanted to ask you if you think there's anything that can sort of be done to, to stem the tide of all of that censorship. Uh, I've sort of broached the topic recently, and this, this, is something, this is something that makes me very much not a conservative here in the United States, is I'm not, you know, I haven't drawn up the, the legislation for it or anything, uh, if only I could, but I've been broaching the topic with many people on the right and left of possibly penalizing employers for firing people for their political opinions. And when we do already protect religious expression in the United States, and, I, and politics has sort of supplanted religion largely as people's sort of guiding life philosophy for better or worse, uh, probably for worse. But I wonder if you're sort of open uh, in your opinion to these, I know, very extreme ideas of just how can we how can we set a baseline rule that people can express themselves freely to maybe you know, toy with the system a little bit and make it so that at the very least, if we're going to do something, it's because there really is the consent of the governed uh, and not just a small band of thugs intimidating them and saying, we're going to ostracize you and fire you if you don't say these things. Are you sort of open to more drastic measures at this point? Do you think there's anything that can be done? I would be open to a law like that. It's not something I've ever thought about, so I can't give an especially intelligent opinion, but I'd definitely be open to it. Like you say, we ban other kinds of discrimination. Uh, so why not discrimination based on opinions as long as they're not, you know, inciting violence or uh, criminal activity? I, I'd be very open to it. Uh, I'm sure there could be a very intelligent rebuttal to it as well, and that could be debated, but it's something definitely something worth considering. I think just from a right-wing perspective as well, uh, the left wing is, they're much smarter about building institutions, about where to drive funding, mm -hmm. about where to drive numbers of activists. And generally, right-wing donors are better at wasting money. Uh, and just in an American context, I've, I've noticed there are so many of these political candidates who'll pop up and they'll be like, yeah, I'm taking the fight to Mayor Cuomo. Please donate $100 million <laughs> because I'm totally conservative and I'm going to beat him and they'll raise huge amounts of money and you'll never hear about them again. Uh, so building these institutions where people have safe employment, they have safe platforms where they can express their opinions is uh, very important. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> the idea of the, the, the very pretentious sort of right-wing activist or politician, I, I'm, I'm all too familiar with that phenomenon here in the States of people who... Uh, raise their profile and raise a lot of money, but don't actually get anything done. And it, it leads me to my, my point in response to what you're saying, which is that I very much fear that, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're open to kind of my idea that I'm kind of, I, you know, a big proponent of at this point of, of taking very drastic measures, particularly when it comes to protecting people's employment, because I think that's the scariest thing when it comes to cancel culture. It sucks to lose your friends, but it sucks even more to lose your livelihood because you literally can't feed yourself at that point. Um, but uh, in any case, I worry very much that, you know, if the right is sort of tasked as the out party in the, in the West, or certainly in the US right now, um, with dealing with this in a very serious and urgent way, you know, I, 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 these conversations for me have become quite urgent because it, it, it's becoming kind of untenable. And I, I feel like things could unravel at any minute. I mean, we sort of saw that in the summer of 2020 to an extent um, with the censorship there and what was going on there. I just worry that there is no sense of urgency on the right with the task they have been given. Like you're just starting to see Republican politicians in the States like tweet about cancel culture and they don't even really apply it correctly. They just kind of use it as a generic term. I had a round table on cancel culture a couple of weeks ago and we were discussing this. Right wingers here will sometimes use it as just kind of a generic term for things they don't like and, and, and use it incorrectly. And it's frustrating because it feels like the people you would entrust to push back on the left, which is the established right-wing political party here in the United States, the Republican Party, they are really asleep at the wheel right now. And they're not having these kinds of conversations about how do we address, in my opinion, one of the biggest issues in the Western world, 
which is a huge incursion on freedom of speech that everyone sort of knows and understands to be the case, but no one is doing anything about. Yeah, it's really quite fascinating how even the media outlets that you would imagine to be have some kind of self-conception as dissident, as anti-establishment, have focused so much on controlling opinion and controlling information. There was a very good Harper's essay, I forget the author's name, about the disinformation industry. Just these legions of journalists who've decided that their duty in life is to try and stop their fellow citizens from accessing particular sources of information, which is not to say that there are not you know, acres of terrible sources of information, but that, 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 uh, that this has become such a key focal point for liberal politics is really quite fascinating. And I, th I think there's some honest paranoia at the heart of it. Uh, they really do believe that the right wing are just kind of, just kind of lurking, waiting to overthrow the country. I'm, I'm unfortunate enough that I'm reading Hillary Clinton's new book, which has this plot, you know, it's this right wing coup that they, they, they hate. You know, the, 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 I, I think this is where it's going anyway. I can't say I haven't finished it, but you know, they hate the immigrants, the gay marriage. They're gonna overthrow us all. We have to be on guard. Uh, and this, yeah, this has become very central to the liberal identity. It's just kind of built, ballasting itself against the unwashed hordes. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know as much as you about Republican politics, but it's interesting to see. It will be interesting to see which direction they take to, to challenge that. Yeah, and I, I'm not super familiar. I know, I know almost nothing about Polish politics, and I only know a little tiny bit about politics in the UK. Um, I know you've lived in Poland for a while, so I don't know how connected you are to what's going on in the UK right now, but I haven't seen Boris Johnson's conservative coalition doing a whole lot. I know that there is a conversation about self-ID when it comes to kind of the transgender pronoun stuff that is actually taking place in the UK. And I found that encouraging because we can't even talk about that here in the United States without getting fired. Um, but other than that, it seems like just all around the West, again, everyone's kind of asleep at the wheel, including like, I, I actually really respect Boris Johnson. I, I vastly prefer him to a, a Donald Trump as a political figure and a leader, but He's been a, a bit of a disappointment, but I, I want to zero in on something you were saying, which I think is very important, which is you talked about you know, media outlets and, and journalists who, in theory, need to be the most in favor of freedom of speech, especially if they sort of are branded as sort of a dissident outlet, which to some extent, all media outlets are supposed to be. There, there is sort of a, a general uh, opposing relationship between government institutions and journalists, because one of the best things a journalist can do is uncover deep corruption in the government. You know, if you, if you have this sort of truth seeking model of journalism, uh, you know, Watergate being one of the most famous examples here in the United States um, of that sort of uncovering corruption. But what we find is that journalists are, as you were sort of alluding to, they're going out of their way to actually, they, they'll say that they're like stemming the tide of, of terrorism and they'll say that they are they basically they, they print a lot of material that is encouraging social media companies to suppress free speech. And this has become especially evident with the whole Facebook whistleblower thing. I heard about a Facebook whistleblower and I was through the roof. I was going, oh, my God, they're going to blow the lid off the censorship. But she was actually a whistleblower who was asking for more censorship because her 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 whistle to blow was that there was too much uh, uh, terrorism and 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 hate on the platform. And I just thought that was too funny. What do you make at this point of sort of the, the journalism world? Like the people who are, they're, they're acting so bizarrely because in, in theory, a journalist is this very heroic figure. And yet it's, it's, it's become very evident to me over the course of the past five years that that's not the case. What do you make of these people who are whistleblowers or journalists? And yet they seem to be so in favor of these authoritarian and anti-free speech dictates. The, the whistleblower thing in particular, I thought was just hilarious. Yeah, that was very funny. I mean, it's you imagine this whistleblower being this figure who has to be kind of you know smuggled yeah. from country to country they, they, around. They, they the wrote world out the red carpet for her. Yeah, I know she's going to be on like Celebrity Apprentice, yeah. or whatever you have. Uh, that was uh, ridiculous. And I mean, to be fair, I guess the one thing I'd say to be fair, I don't think journalists should necessarily have like a hostile attitude towards governments because 
that kind of establishes a principle where we, we, we always are against the government. Right. And I mean, Republicans were very critical during the Trump years, rightly or wrongly, of how uh, kind of impulsively critical of the government journalists became. So you, you don't want them to be sycophantic, but you don't want them to be thoughtlessly critical at the same time. But definitely now, I think they see themselves uh, in general again. I'm not applying that to everybody, but I think some of the most influential journalists see themselves as kind of defending this final outpost of liberal norms and liberal values, progressive values, and just being constantly under attack by these forces of populism and reaction and disinformation. There's a very, very embattled relationship. Mm. So that their sense of themselves as dissenting has gone from being one that's looking inwards at the government and at corporations to being one that's looking outwards at the masses. Yeah, you bring up the point, and it, it is important, and it's something that's kind of lost on me you bring up the point that in many cases, these people are true believers. They believe that democracy is under attack. And it certainly doesn't help that you have unforced errors like the January 6th Capitol riot, uh, which was at the very least a borderline insurrection, or if you ask anyone in the mainstream world, a full-on insurrection, which it certainly plays into those fears. And it's it's been very, very useful to them. And they've been beating it like a drum, as is expected. But I, it's sort of always lost on me, and I'm glad you brought it up, that a lot of these people truly believe this stuff, because to me, it's so utterly ridiculous. Like, I, for me, if you were to tell me, like, the idea that there's a serious white supremacy problem in the United States, to me, that, are, that occurs immediately as a conspiracy theory. It rises to the level of conspiracy theory. It is so demonstrably false. I mean, if you just look at the numbers, like, if you just look at, if you just do some math on how many people in the United States hold clearly racist views and are willing to stand up for them, it becomes evident very quickly. Uh, you know, and, and the biggest myth there is the, the Black Lives Matter thing, where there's this, this idea that uh, you know, Black people are slaughtered in the streets on a daily basis throughout the Western world, and especially in the United States. Again, just looking at the numbers, not true, like demonstrably not true. And so I, it always kind of, I have such a hard time believing that these educated people, right? Journalists are by almost by definition, educated people. Uh, you know, their job is to educate others in theory, uh, that they believe this stuff. So, do, I mean, do you definitely think that like, I guess you mentioned the levels of the sort of the commentary before, and I guess I'll ask the question this way, at what levels do you think you have your true believers? And at what levels do you think you kind of have your cynics who sort of know that these things are borderline conspiracy theories, but they sell them anyway. Like I always think of somebody who's like a, a broadcast journalist, like in the United States, we have CNN, we have Don Lemon or Chris Cuomo. They occur to me as very cynical. I'm like, they don't believe this stuff for a second. Where do you think, how do you think that plays out at the, at the different sort of levels of, of the commentary? Where do you think you have your true believers? Where do you think you have your kind of like grifters? That's a very good question. I suspect they are just intermingled. Yeah, And also, I, I suspect that people can be mostly true believers and then they kind of tolerate the rest of it. So someone like a Chris Cuomo, he's probably more like, you know, a resistance liberal, like he has this idealized perception of democratic norms and liberal values kind of coming out of the 70s and the 80s. Uh, and then the, the, the more fringe stuff, he probably just kind of tolerates and thinks, so oh, that's... That's kid stuff. They're going to grow out of it in the future. These older journalists. Uh, and then I, yeah, I, I suspect the cynics just stud at all levels. Mm. Uh, but I, I'm not necessarily sure that there's one level where they've all mm. established themselves. I mean, you read, uh, I mentioned this kind of top level, the New York Times. There's a New York Times columnist where, if we, I forget his name, I think his name's Charles Blow. I felt, I don't read him anymore, but I felt like every week it was Donald Trump, white supremacy, Donald Trump, white supremacy, Donald Trump, white supremacy. And maybe he is sitting at home thinking, wow, what a good thing I've got to get on. But I doubt it. I suspect he really believes it. I mean, that's the charitable explanation. So probably at all levels, you have people who genuinely believe it and then people who are thinking, you know, I'm, this is a good career I've got up here. Uh, I can't let it slip. 
Yeah, I, I honestly, I worry about the sanity of people at a certain point when they really believe this, this stuff, because like I said, the, it, I, I just, I don't know. I, I, I like to be very candid on this show. And so I will be, I just don't know how people dress themselves in the morning when they believe some of this stuff. I, it's, it's, some of it is so bizarre. A lot of the gender stuff, for instance, five minutes ago in the grand scheme of things, you know, like the, the arc of human history is long. <laughs> uh, it's like five minutes ago in the grand scheme of things, there was not a peep about the idea that you could essentially choose your sex, essentially by virtue of the way that you feel on the inside, choose to be a male or a female. This was unheard of like five minutes ago. And I don't know how people who would have agreed with me five minutes ago in the grand scheme of things, who suddenly completely flipped their worldview on its head, just as soon as they were pressured to do so even slightly, I worry about them mentally. And I worry about people who also believe that, you know, there's police slaughtering black Americans in the street for no reason at all. Like these are things that if they were happening, you would actually expect them to be even more ferocious. For instance, if I knew for a fact that police were summarily executing black people for no reason in the United States, I would be furious and I would be out in the streets and I'd be breaking shit because that's a horrible thing. But I, I mean, so, so my question to you, Ben, is how much do you worry about just the sanity of the public where it seems like there's a very small percentage of people who look at an event that seems almost too crazy to be true? That's how I always think of it is, does this seem a little bit too convenient to my own worldview, like a little bit too crazy? And what you're supposed to do is sort of deconfirm. You're supposed to look for evidence against sort of like your own little peer review system. But it seems like most people are just delving so deeply into the most extreme, I, I would call them conspiracy theories because, I mean, conspiracy theory can mean a number of things, but the general idea, the, the connotation is that it's false. How much do you worry about our ability to just exist peaceably in a world where it seems like so many people are, they're almost mentally ill? Well, I think first, I think people, human beings are quite good at disassociating their opinions from mm. their behavior. I mean, uh, let's take religion, for example. Now, I'm not saying that religious ideas are crazy. I'm very much an agnostic. Uh, I'm not sure. But you would kind of expect if you're an alien who just appeared on Earth, that if you believed that after this world, there's a choice between, you know, some people are going to go to eternal paradise and some people are going to go to eternal suffering. Like, this world would be completely revolved around. Yeah. There, there would be no way of behaving without having your every, you know, waking moment directed towards, you know, trying to get people to the paradise and trying to get people to avoid the hell. And again, I want to emphasize, I'm not saying that isn't, in fact, the case. Um, but clearly there's something built into our psychology where we can have such dramatic beliefs, but we can still cut the grass mm. and go to work and think about if we want to have spaghetti or pizza for lunch and just all of our beliefs, we just kind of forget about them until it's time to talk about them again. So I think most people who have political beliefs that I consider to be bananas probably in their normal lives of you know pretty conventional people mm. unless they happen to be talking about politics and then they might get a bit ferocious but definitely these kind of vanguards of ideologies who really seek conflict i mean there was a mainstream published book called in defense of looting after uh the rioting yeah. in 2020 uh, these are people who are trying to stir people up into violence and obviously, history tells us that under certain political and economic conditions, that is achievable. So I don't worry about most people's mental health as it relates to politics, but there is potential for, for wider conflict under somewhat different conditions than we have now. So it is something to bear in mind. Yeah, th this is a this is an interesting point, and I guess the the proof is kind of there that people's capacity to compartmentalize their sort of extreme political views, which 
unfortunately are becoming more mainstream by the day. Because here in the United States, I always wonder, has it crossed over the 50% point, the number of people who think you can, in essence, choose your own sex or any number of things? But you are right that, you know, I, I do, I think about this thing that I brought up to you and I go outside and I see people existing peaceably. They are in theory, Democrat, Republican, black, white, all of, you know, and, and it, I, I very much believe that the media has sort of been fomenting. Uh, and it, it's something that I abhor. They've been in some cases like fomenting, trying to foment a, a race war or a war between Democrats and Republicans. And I see people existing peaceably and it, it does sort of put me at ease uh, whenever I see this. Um so I guess, I guess just to, sorry for interrupting. I guess no, go ahead. the contrarian point would be potentially being at ease becomes a bad thing. I mean, the more insane beliefs get, the more they encroach upon society. Maybe mm. our instinct towards kind of adapting to that situation uh, can become a negative thing. I mean, you have. So I'm I'm just going to pick a deliberately horrendous example. But you have kind of, you know, this trans, uh, not trans, good drag kid thing uh, that was big in 2020. You had all of these articles about this little kid, this little boy dressing up in woman's clothes. Desmond. Know, adult makeup, prancing around, mm -hmm. uh, being in a video with some kind of, uh, mur you know, club murderer from the 90s. Uh, and that's a situation where you want people to be like, no, this is terrible. We need to stop this now. You know, who's the guardian of this child? Who can we contact? Who can we write to? You know, how can we how can we step into this situation? But because most of us are quite good at just being like, oh, that's terrible. Anyway, what's on the other channel? Uh, yeah. It's a kind of it's a mixed blessing. Do you think there's? Uh... Do you think to some extent that's sort of a, a consequence of maybe modernity or, or post-modernity? I'm not actually sure which term is appropriate in this case, but what I'm referring to is people have this capacity to anesthetize themselves these days. You can, I always say, you know, I, I was a, a teenage boy once. These are the two things that come to mind. Uh, you can always play video games and watch porn until you die. Like you, at the end of the day, no matter how angry something makes you, there's enough porn and video games to last until the end of the earth. You just Cheetos, porn, video games. Do you think that that's a factor in how people are able to sort of be looking at these things that would, in theory, infuriate them? And yeah, the, 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 the drag kid thing is a great example. I know exactly who you're talking about. If, you, if you're referring to, I think his name is Desmond in the United States. Mm. Um, uh I mean, how much of that do you think is is just kind of a modernity issue where whereas in the past, your religious and political views and your sort of honor, right? We had an honor culture, your honor as a person, your your standing up for state and for country and for something bigger than yourself, that was primary to your identity. Now it's which Marvel movie is your favorite and which porn star you like to watch them. I mean, like how much do you think it's sort of a modernity problem? Oh, that's I mean, that's a huge factor. Historically, any kind of civil conflict arose from terrible economic conditions and chronic political instability. And obviously the economy is in a bad state. It's probably going to get worse. Obviously our politics are in a bad state, probably going to get worse. But generally people are well fed. Most people still have homes. Most people live in areas where people aren't being shot in the street. You know, there was a transition of power that was peaceful enough that uh, a bunch of eccentrics <laughs> rampaging through a building is still being talked about as if it was the winter revolution. <laughs> so if you just look at it in those kind of reductionist terms, most people, they're okay. Uh, they don't yeah. have that impulse to overturn their lives uh, for a cause. Because generally when people are willing to, and I'm not saying people should be necessarily be willing to overturn their lives, but generally when they do that, it's because they don't have much to lose anyway. Yeah. And, and there's some evidence of what you're talking about with sort of the idea of as long as you keep people's as long as you kind of give people the the real things that they want, which you know it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. First, they want food, shelter, water, but it's eventually they want their their video games and their Cheetos and everything. And, and if they still have all that they might sort of be satiated. There's some evidence that uh, showed kind of a microcosm of the opposite scenario, which was those 2020 summer riots. Because what we were seeing was the coronavirus had kicked in, certainly in the United States. It was, well, the United States had it worse than almost anywhere else. Um, and 
we were laying people off left and right. A lot of people were unemployed and suddenly they felt like they didn't have that sort of basic need set met. And we came as close as we've ever come to, in my opinion, a true insurrection. It wasn't an insurrection, but it was as close as we've ever come with those riots where essentially you had, you know, you had terror in the streets in almost every major city across America and very little being done to stop it. Um, and I, I, I bet that is sort of, it's hard to imagine it wasn't connected to the economic conditions under COVID. That's true. Although I think another interesting thing about that is people, generally the people who took part in the riots weren't overturning their lives. You know, even people who went to jail, I, I'm sure it wasn't everybody, but even people who went to jail got quickly bailed out by Hollywood celebrities. I don't know how many mm. people are still in prison because of things they did during the riots. Maybe someone's going to say in the comments, you know, this guy did get a life sentence. So I could be wrong. Take it with a pinch of salt. But from what I know, not many people ended up with long jail sentences. There weren't, I'm sure there were some injuries taken as a result of police actions, but really not many. Uh, it was still a high status enough thing to take part in that someone could write a very mainstream book about it. You know, nobody's, nobody's going to get a widely reviewed book like in defense of January the 6th. Uh, and all the people who were, as far as I know, most of the people who walked into that building, they're facing very, very severe prosecution indeed. Lots of them have been in prison basically since then. Uh, yeah. So 2020 was like, it was almost like a riot. You were free to be, take part in. Yeah, it, it, it went beyond the safety of a mob. I mean, the safety of the mob is kind of the base level for any mob. But in this case, it was the safety of like, literally, <laughs> there's an entire cottage industry dedicated to excusing your actions this evening. Like, like there's, there is an entire media uh, infrastructure dedicated to, to the point where people were, de they were one, denying that the rioting was even happening. Uh, or two, if there was incontrovertible tr proof, which eventually there was, they would say that it was justified. As you said, there was a indefensive looting article there were there was an abolish the police movement that was rather short-lived but of course that's the the idea that that was even part of the conversation showed that this was um it, your 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 point that it was not particularly risky is very well taken that it it, it doesn't it's not necessarily an example of people saying let's start an actual revolution because in an actual revolution you could die <laughs> that's kind of the idea of a revolution is that you take a great risk as the american revolutionaries did <laughs> uh so many years ago um so yeah i i think that's an interesting point and it, it just it it reemphasizes how you can kind of the things that you were excused to do via this system, it's very funny because they always talk about systemic racism or systemic uh, patriarchy or whatever on the left, but really there's a system dedicated to this sort of social justice authoritarian ideology that really under the right circumstances and the summer 2020 seemed to be the best example, will allow for almost anything to happen. And in the case of what you were mentioning with uh, the, the, the young drag kid, I mean, I won't go so far as to say child molestation, but things that are close enough to it that you'd think again that there would be an uproar. The, 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 you know, and the example that is more extreme would be I don't know if you've heard of a uh, drag queen story hours, but there have been at least uh, a couple examples where you know the drag queens are being invited to the library to read to children, and in at least one or two examples there are lap dances and things going on. I, I don't, you know, it's, it's, it's horrific. And it, it is astounding. The, uh, I guess just the, the, the propagandistic power uh, to, to get people to, in some cases, not only shut up about it, but to actually twist themselves in knots explaining why it's okay. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's using, obviously I jumped to an extreme example. I'm aware of that. I know there's not kind of millions of drag kids, Right, But I, I think the really clever propaganda trick at the heart of it, whether, whether it's conscious or not, because however many kids there were, they got a lot of media attention that in any other time would be considered basically advocacy for uh, child porn. I didn't want to say child erotica, that just sounds revolting, but you know what I mean. Uh, in another time, that's exactly what it would have been considered to be. Uh, what's, what's clever about it is it's framed in a way where if you have a problem with it, it's you who's being weird. 
Like, what do you mean there's something sexual about you? We're not saying that. You've got a problem. Or, you know, drag queen story hour. What do you mean there's something obscene about it? We're not saying it's obscene. You know, it's just, it's just their identity. You, you, you've got the problem. Which is very, very clever. Whether it's whether it's conscious or not, I don't know if it's that cynical. But, uh, it's it's interesting. Do you think it's um? Th- there's a term people really like to use over the course of the last five years. It kind of started on the on the left, and people are using it more on the right. Do you think it uh, it rises to the level of gaslighting, which is this idea that you get people to challenge their own sanity, sort of their own basic, you know, presuppositions about the world? Do you think that because because to me it almost does to tell someone that age. <laughs> a drag queen reading to children. And if you've ever been to a drag show, you kind of know where that culture comes from and, and what a lot of the motivating factors are to say that that is not at least subtly sexual. Uh, it, it, it does rise to the level of gaslighting. Would, would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. To the extent that it's a useful word, it absolutely is. Yeah. It absolutely is. I wanted to ask that because it is that word is misused more often than it is used properly. And I was wondering if we actually had the rare caught in the wild appropriate use of the term gaslighting, which it looks like we may have. So kudos to us. But uh, I want to ask you um, another thing, Ben, Uh, this will be my last question. I know that we we had an hour. I want to ask in doing my my pre-show research about you and just reading more of your stuff. It occurred to me that you, you write about almost anything. You write about a lot of different things. You have a lot of different interests and one of the things that's kind of astounded me with the woke thing over the course of particularly the last five years has been its capacity to reach its hand into literally everything, every industry, every mode of art, every, every medium, just everything. As someone who has all of these sort of eclectic interests, have you found that to be the case? And if so, what have you made of that? Like, how has that impacted you? Are, are you seeing are you seeing what I'm seeing, which is that there's almost nowhere you can go. Uh, it seems like every day you go somewhere else. Like for me, it was, I went to, at one point I retreated into like my gaming community and then it very quickly, like, cause it's funny. Cause I was an atheist, right? I was part of the atheist community. It immediately made its way into atheism. And then I went to the gaming community and immediately went into, into the gaming community. It seems like there's nowhere you can hide from it. Have you found that that's kind of the case? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, they, the idea that everything can be reduced to, uh, you know, sexist prejudice, whether structural or otherwise, or racial prejudice, whether structural or otherwise, or I guess in the past it would have been class conflict, not so much anymore, now it's more identitarian. But the idea that you can reduce pretty much anything down to this conflict inevitably makes everything about the conflict. Yeah. So... People, yeah, you know, comic books, it's all, we have to debate sexism in comic books. Uh, Games, we have to debate sexism in games. You know, maths, biology, you know, this astronomer is wearing a shirt with scantily clad women on it. We must talk about this. I don't know if you remember that. I do. That was one of the first big examples that I remember. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's part, that's partly because of the nature of their beliefs. And it's also in, if I want to be slightly more cynical, it's just a way that people can elevate themselves. Because mm. I, can, I can become a big deal in the world of literature, for example, without reading literature or engaging with it on any kind of deep aesthetic or linguistic or thematic level, just by you know, making a big deal about one of these identity topics. Mm. So it's a good way of inserting yourself at the top of a conversation because you have a, you have a lot of urgency built into your own idea. Uh, so I definitely think that's true. But I mean, I also think whatever people's opinions are, it's very easy to become boring just because we all know that certain topics are going to get you noticed. Uh, certain topics are very quick worthy. Uh, there's, a, there's a big market for certain kinds of opinion. You know, you have your brand as the very social justice guy, you have your brand as the very pro-Trump guy, mm. you have your brand as the MAGA critical right-wing guy, and it's very tempting to try and fit yourself into this little cubby hole and just make yourself fit the space uh, because it's a way of getting work or it's a way of getting attention. But I just don't see the point because what's the point of writing if it's not about something you're curious about or... Uh, 
there's nothing that's unusual to the way you want to say something or to the way you see something. I mean, what, what are you doing? You might as well just mm. write advertising. Uh, I think it's more respectable to write, you know, flat out advertising than to write something you don't really believe in or you don't really care about. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of temptations to resist, uh, but I don't think it's worth, I don't think anything is worth making yourself tedious. Yeah, it's it becomes ever more difficult to to avoid. But one place you can avoid it is this show. Another place you can avoid it is with the writing of Mr. Ben Sixsmith. And I want to ask you, Ben, before we sign off. I know we have to sign off in a minute. Uh, is there anything you want to promote on the show today? Let people know, you know, where they can find you on social media or, or your writing. Uh, so on Twitter, I'm at bd Sixsmith. That's S I X S M I T H. And on Substack, it's and sixsmith.substack.com. Excellent. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Ben. Everyone be sure to check out Ben's stuff. There's a lot of good stuff there. And like I said, uh, you know, he writes about a lot of different things. So you'll probably find something interesting if you, if you look him up. Uh, thanks again for coming on the show. Thanks to everyone for listening and watching. If you're watching on YouTube, please like, comment, and subscribe. If you are watching on iTunes, please leave a five-star review. Thanks again for listening. I will see you guys next time on the Veritas Podcast. <laughs>